Hey everybody, Martin Chuck here. Good morning. Got my cup of coffee here. And this is a cool little cup. I've got Jackson Chuck's handprint on there from, let's see here, a long time ago. April 30th, 2010. Amazing how the kids have gotten big, grown up. It's all pretty darn cool. Um, yeah, there we go. Move that little screen out of the way. Perfect. So I hope everybody's doing great out there. A little, some updates from the tour. If you were under a rock yesterday, you did not uh, see that Dustin Johnson, I think he was seven under through five holes. And that was not in the, in the C-Flight Net Club Championship. That was legit seven under through five holes. Pretty crazy. He shot 27 on the front nine. And then he limped in on the back nine. He went shot, uh, what did he shoot? 60, shot 11 under par. And everybody's talking about the DJ show. The DJ show news, my phone was going off. I didn't watch a shot, to be fair. Uh, I put together a Murphy bed yesterday. You want to talk about having some fun? Murphy bed assembly, 85,000 screws, a couple of bloody knuckles. Other than that, it's up safe. And I don't know if I want to sleep in it if you ever stay at my house, but it's up there. So also, Scotty Scheffler stole the show. He shot 59. This kid is unbelievable. Fellow Nike guy, I might add. Way to go, Scotty Scheffler. He won the U.S. Junior at Martis Camp up in Tahoe, in Truckee, actually. Sorry, I shouldn't. I got to say Truckee. Martis Camp up in Truckee a number of years back when I spent the summer up there. Many of you watched those Revolution Golf videos in the, in the beautiful Tall Pines. That was Martis Camp. He played a fantastic match against the second place fella. And as you know, we, do n we never remember who second place was. But to the second place guy, I have a cup of coffee drink for you. Scotty Scheffler, U.S. Junior Champion. And I think he's got, uh, I'm going to go on record now saying Scotty's got two majors in them and conservatively 12 PGA Tour events. That's what I'm going to say. Now, as Coach Cameron McCormick can be saying, Martin, he's got eight majors in them and 42 PGA Tour events. I hope that's the case. I'm just picking an amazing career out. But uh, who's lead? Oh, Cameron Martin's in third. It's Cameron Martin. Smart baller, regular user of the old tour striker, smart baller to kind of uh, keep those arms together. Oh, last week on the show on Sunday, um, and you know, smart balls are sold out. We get all this ink when stuff sold out. Anyway, Doc Redman was warming up on Sunday, and Nick Faldo was like, oh, he's got that uh, he's got that ball between his arms. And then Mark Immel Immelman said, oh, that's the smart ball invented by Martin Chuck. Thanks, Mark, for the shout out. I appreciate that. So it'll be interesting to see. Today on tour, Tiger is playing with Rory which normally would be awesome, but they're in like 55th place. So I wish I was saying to the producer, Steve and Jared here, I said, it'd be kind of fun if they had like a side action, maybe a match play, maybe something for charity. Tour might think of something like that. That'd be fun. People are going to watch anyway. Let's face it. It's Rory and Tiger. It's James Bond and Captain America playing golf together and having some fun out there for 18 holes, smashing, hopefully playing some great golf today. Um, today's episode is all about Ask Martin. So we have some cool questions from Instagram. We're going to go where this is live. I know some of you watching this are watching it a month later, two months later. But believe me, I'm standing here live. I got up to, out of bed, washed the face, got all prettied up for you. Going to do some live questions for you and have some fun. Um, Instagram people, we sent some in. We're going to get to probably half of those. So if I missed the, those that I missed, I'll just kind of send you a video. So thank you for um, asking questions. And we're going to go live to YouTube, too, for whoever types in the old chat box. So let's get to it, shall we? Before we do, let's do the um, let's do the Why You Suck segment. Is that okay? Can we do that, Producer Steve? Let's do that. We've got Bob. Okay, so Bob is a tour striker guy. He's got lots of products. We're going to go to the Why You Suck. Let's check out Bob here real quick. Bob's strong and fit. Now, I slowed this down. I should have played this at regular speed. This swing is hyper fast. Okay, it's like, whew, whew, it's over. Okay, and I'm putting a few little lines in here because I want to talk about it, kind of jog my memory when I look at it. You kind of see this little reverse spine tilt he's got. So he kind of gets this thing up there, and he's a strong guy with a lot of speed, a lot of ground force, at kind of at the wrong time. This right arm of his is going to be ramrod straight here at impact, and he's got pretty strong wrist condition, so he's going to hit a lot of shots to the left. Okay, I know it's politics time, but this, this ball is going over to the left over here. And let's see what we see down the line from him. Look at that right arm right there. It looks like he's, in a, he's gonna try to rip a phone book in half here in a second. We wanna see that right arm a lot softer. Okay, so I've got some more lines. That, those three red lines mean that right arm is like Hulk smash right arm. So club goes out, he's got a lot of arm management. He's probably overdone some things that you'd wanna see with a lot of coaches, okay? So he's got good elbow management. He's got kind of the bowed, 
the bowed lead wrist. This club's coming down. He's in flexion. Now he's going to jump kind of up, and you'll see his angle between his torso and his legs change quite a bit. So he's got laid off strong wrist condition here. And normally I'd say this would be great, but he's got the wrong matchup. Okay, he's got the wrong matchup that is going to produce some shots that are probably unsavory. Jumping up out of posture, trail arm gets too long too fast. When we look at that, notice how everything's really square. Knees are square, hips are square, shoulders are square. Right arm is straight, right? For his target line relationship, that right arm is dead straight. And typically that face is going to be trying to close like crazy. So let's go ahead and pull that off the screen. Let's talk about Bob in the Why You Suck segment, Bob. Now, obviously, really strong, good athlete, in great shape. Awesome. Really good players have some cool things in common. They can take this trail arm and they can get to impact before this arm runs its course. So we've got to, you've got to understand how to say, okay, I've got, you know, and the viewers didn't see, I should have just played the swing four or five times. What they would have, what they would have seen is a, you know, a really quick waggle and a, like a super fast event. Now, normally, awesome. I love up-tempo golf swings. I love ath athletic, fast swings. You would be probably the one in 50 people at a golf school that'd say, hey, Bob, we need some melatonin. We'll call the cart girl over. We'll do a shot together. We'll calm you down just a little bit. We'll slow you down just a little bit, okay? I want to get this. I want to get you develop a trail arm where you really recognize a bent right wrist, a bent elbow, and how we can transport that bent event into impact so that we can control the club face a little bit more because as soon as this right arm gets long that club face we lose that relationship we lose the club face relationship and then the ball is going to go all over the yard you're going to get tired of hitting it left and you're going to manipulate that face a little bit not to do that maybe hit some weak ones straight well you're pretty strong so maybe they're not that weak but my point is let's get you organized and see if we can't have this sensation of here's a dress and let's build impact. And notice what I'm doing here. The shaft is mildly out of alignment with my left arm. Okay, there's a soft bent back lead wrist. As I push my, as I rotate my hips into my lead heel, notice how that little bend kind of comes out of there. So I want you to understand where impact is. And go ahead, there's my long right arm. And then when I go into this impact, notice how my right shoulder gets closer to the ground, my right elbow bends, and my right wrist is bent. So you could do this little dance right here a bunch of times. If you put on Donna Summer, pick an up-tempo song, and maybe get into this. And guess who this kind of looks like? That's kind of Matthew Wolf's kind of, you know, that's his little trigger move. So him and his court coach, George Gankus, I don't know. Maybe they programmed that in. Maybe he always did that. I have no idea. But when you see this little event with Matthew Wolf, he's got some programming. He's got this primer. You know, he's got that swing trigger that helps him a lot. Well, you can practice that to understand impact impacts where we collect the golf ball with a bent trail elbow bent trail wrist so feels for you let's see if we can take kind of total motion 50 percent energy full swings half energy okay so it looks something like this you've got a net in the yard there awesome let's see if you can kind of get yourself in the in in the i call it like some kind of thick liquid molasses would be great so here's my molasses backswing completely gone hyper slow, super, super slow, so that I can have this sense of delivering this bent trail elbow, bent trail wrist into impact. So Ben Hogan, if you go on YouTube, you can search Ben Hogan, slow motion, Tai Chi swings, whatever, I forget how it's listed, but Ben Hogan did these his entire life. He'd take these full swings, super slow, slower than this. I mean, it takes a minute for him to make a swing, a practice swing. I'm not saying you have to do it that slowly, but I absolutely want you understanding the moment of impact. Now, during your backswing, everything was really kind of tight and, hype, and you know, soften things up a little bit. And again, you're the one in 20 that I might say to that, you know, tell somebody to do that. But in your case, I want you to soften it up a bit. So again, get your good hands on there. Feel like you're in molasses, like moving the club in molasses would be slow, deliberate, okay? Move this club back really slow. Feel as you work down. I can sense my bent trail arm, my bent trail wrist, my weight getting into my lead side. 
slowly unwinding. I can see my hands are on top of my golf ball from my visual perspective right now. Here's my bent trail arm, bumping a ball and going to a finish. I'd love to see you do 20 of those. I mean, your neighbors will think you're crazy, right? But that's okay. Take them out golfing in a few weeks and beat their behinds because you'll do great. Because all we're trying to do is have a little bit more awareness, taking out just the flash of a golf swing so our brain can be just a bit more aware of how our body's going to move through the strike. So slow things down a little bit. I rarely say that. I'm saying that to you. Let's be very, very aware of this trail arm and how our body goes into side bend. Here's me side bending. There's right side bend. Here's me side bending with some rotation. Okay, so those are the pieces I'd love to see you focus on. Ultimately, we're going to be getting into impact with a bent trail elbow, bent trail wrist for you right-handed golfer, Bob, before that runs its course and gets long. Because if it's long too soon, guess what? That face is flashy. You're going to hit it all over the yard. And this is, I think this might even come up in one of the Instagram questions later. So, Bob, that's why you suck. No, but anyway, you pay attention to that. Slow things down a little bit. Soften things up. In fact, you kind of overdo the elbows together at the top. You can have little softer elbows. Transport that down. You are going to do a whole lot better. Let's get on to questions. This is all from you guys. Let's answer these questions. Thanks for following me on Instagram if you're watching this. Martin Chuck PGA. And then we've got a couple of business accounts at Tour Striker and at Tour Striker Golf. All things golf. Martin Chuck. All things instructional. So let's have some fun with that. Producer Steve, what do we got? Uh, first question that came through was lining up square with the driver and if you're able to expand upon the flashlight setup. Awesome. So this is from one of my students who's been to a couple of golf schools. Lining up square with the driver. So let's talk about it. And you're going to say, Martin, is that a jumbo grip? Yes, it is a jumbo grip. So I'm playing around with that for a little bit. And this may be off tomorrow. But for today, it is on there. So lining up square with the driver and the flashlight. Well, the flashlight is Courtney Mahon, Coach Court. A tour striker coach got a great studio, great school in Kansas City, Kansas. You'll want to check that out. Anyway, Coach Courtney, back in the day we taught a lot. She she was my primary coach at the golf school. Now she's up at Falcon Ridge, Falcon Falcon Ridge, I think, is her course. But the whole idea behind lining up square is when we get this golf ball forward in her stance. Here's what tends to happen. You know, we'll reach down to get the club behind the ball. If you look on the right screen, you'll see what I'm talking about. You reach down behind the ball, and you'll see that my shoulders open up. Well, to manage your shoulder alignments, you guys, here's what I want you to think about. My pelvis, if I had a flashlight taped on my behind aiming straight at you, I could shine the flashlight to my left over here, or I could shine the flashlight to my right over here. All too many people are conscious of the target line, you know, running down this kind of putting, my well putt putting mat here. And what happens is we get into it and we start looking down this target line. And then if you look on the right screen, everything has a bias to be open. But if I shift my pelvis a little bit, if I aim my flashlight more from the T on Tour Striker over to the R on the end of Tour Striker, what does that do to my shoulders? That gets my shoulders a little bit more organized. So that right there is what I'm talking about and how where I aim my pelvis. So if I rotate my pelvis a little bit, I also help my shoulders. Rather than having hips back and then trying to fight shoulders, that doesn't work. Let's go ahead and rotate that pelvis. The shoulders will square a little bit more naturally. Then you're going to have a little bit better swing direction. Ultimately, that, that's what we want. Swing direction is just where your hula hoop is pointing. My hula hoops are going to bias to the left. My hula hoop is going to bias to the right. And you'll see as I rotate my pelvis a little bit, that influences my swing direction. And that's going to help you get your club traveling down Main Street and touching Main Street a little bit better. So that is the answer to that. Hopefully that makes sense. Pelvis location will help your swing direction. And that's aiming your flashlight a bit more biasy behind you to the left. Square you up. Let's move on to the next question, Producer Steve. Yes, Dino, a claimant user, is uh, still coming over the top with his driver. Would like some suggestions. Still, okay, plain mate Dino. So thanks for your question. If you're still coming over the top, we've got to go kind of to the root cause of why you're doing that. Somewhere deep-seated in there, my friend, there, there's probably something to do with the club face that you're, you're, you're not quite managing properly. So let's, let's address it. So the plane mate, for those of you watching or maybe don't know, I'm going to pop that guy on right here. Let's, uh, let's grab it. 
And let's walk Dino through this. So rail goes on the right side. Pop this on, super easy. Wear it kind of low on the booty, don't want to crush my mic pack. There we go. Awesome. Connector down here. Dino, I don't know where you're from, but I just like saying the word the name Dino. If I have another kid, I'm naming him Dino, but we're past that. Anyway, let's get this club in our good hands. Here we feel this mild tension, a little bit of tension. Sometimes Playmate users, you have this connector way down here, way too tight. Get a little bit of tension there, but not much. There's just a pound or two. So Dino's working through this event of resisting, getting the club more up. This is the umbrella position that we talk about in our protocol videos, resisting and then relaxing. Now, here's the thing. If you've got a bad grip, now Dino, chances are you don't think you have a bad grip. I'm going to tell you nine out of 10 people that come to my golf school, they don't think they have a bad grip. Guess what? They have a bad grip. Okay. They don't have this club face in this delivery position that's fairly typical to most players on tour where the club is a little sliver closed from vertical so there's dead vertical okay here's a little sliver tipped closed from vertical now when you look down do you know if you just go ahead and do this get your get over i don't know if you're left-handed or right-handed pal but assuming get your lead hand your glove hand nice and flat right here get that toe tipped down just the sliver and build your grip from there. And if you take that to address and that feels wonky, well, chances are you had something that was gripping it for comfort rather than for function. Because most folks come in to hit a shot and they put their, they get all nice and organized here. Man, that feels really, really good. But they don't, even though that grip's comfortable, it's not functional to move dynamically with a club face that your genius computer knows is somewhat organized. Because if that face is open, guess what? You're gonna figure out a way to get that face more closed. And usually you're gonna do that by throwing the club head out and backing up to buy time because the backing up gives you time to square the face. So if we get the club face on there a little bit better, Dino, right? You get your plane mate and you do this exercise where you just get this mildly taut, just the basic element of taut right there. Get your left hand or lead hand on there. Make sure that's tipped down. Swivel that back in front of you. And that right there is a nice square tour hand grip. Now when you resist, relax and rotate, that face is in a better spot for you to hit stronger shots that won't want to slice or pull. Because let's face it, when you come over the top, you've got a little bit of either pull tendency or maybe if the face is too square for that, you're going to hit fades. If the face is open, it's like, see ya. Anyway, hopefully that helps. Usually it's some kind of a grip thing because it's always the response to a face. We're always responding to what the face is doing in our golf swing. So hopefully that helps you, Dino. All the best. Producer Steve. Go ahead and keep that playmate Keep it on. on. Keeping the playmate on. Uh, another playmate is your Joshua. His normal misses off the toe. Okay. Using the playmate, he relaxes his hands and rotates, and now he's hitting it off the heel. Cool. Joshua, right? Joshua? So Joshua is missing. He usually misses off the toe. Now with the playmate on, he's missing off the heel. So let's get into a gunfight, Joshua. You ready for this? I'm going to get my pistols out. They're all shined up, ready to go there. Oh, I forgot to put bullets in them. But if I have my elbows on my side, see, a lot of people like to grip the golf club and they get the, this is them. Their arms are at their sides. Well, here's what happens. You put the plane mate on and now all of a sudden we get these arms way more in front of us. This relationship of arms way more in front of us is something you're not quite used to. Sorry, but you will be. There's one of two things going on here. And we get this question all the time in customer service. I have my playmate on and I'm shanking it. And I'm like, good. You know what that tells me as a coach? It tells me as a coach that you've developed this comfort level of having your elbows and arms a little too close to your sides rather than getting your arms up in front of you, what I call volleyball arms. So see how close my humerus bones are together? They really like each other, okay? Get these things up and on top of you. Get your humerus bones on your pecs a little bit as though you can bump past a volleyball to somebody in a beach volleyball contest. Okay, so get your good arm, get your good hands on there. Get this arm up in front of you, organize yourself. Now there's a little bit of tension. Sometimes people put too much tension on the band and then their brain goes, oh, I need to force, 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 and it shoves the thing out. There's not a whole lot of tension at address, just a pound or so. So arms in front, get yourself organized. You'll feel way more tense across the upper body if you've been used to being cozy like this. 
So get your arms up in front of you. Enjoy that structural tension that it puts in. And then from there, you'll have center cut roasters with your Playmate on. So Joshua, I hope that helps. Thanks for being a product purchaser of Playmate and enjoying that. And we appreciate you. Next question, producer Steve. From Instagram. Instagram. Like underscore M would like to know, how do you get your weight on the backswing? Okay, cool. So weight to the right. Wait to the red. So what's his name? Bo. Uh, go hike underscore. Go hike underscore M. Go hike. Cool. So how do you get your weight to the trail foot on the backswing? Good question. Usually not a big problem for many, but this is a good one. So sometimes it's interesting. You know, my my son Jackson is kind of going through this a little bit right now, and it's partly I want to say because he likes to hit balls in the studio, and you'll notice my eyes wander up over here because my monitor's up on the left. And he's constantly kind of making a backswing, kind of looking up that way. So I'm like, huh, maybe we got to change where the monitor is to affect what he does in his backswing a little bit. But let's talk about it. Put the old playmate down. So sometimes go hike underscore M. Sometimes eye dominance plays a role here. Okay, I've noticed this a bunch of times. It'd be interesting to know what your dominant eye is. And to do that, it's pretty simple. Make a little circle. You know, kind of look up and you'll see one, one of them you're going to look right through one of them. So, for example, if I'm using the face on camera and I'm looking at the face on camera, my dominant eye is my left eye. If I close my left eye, my right eye, my non-dominant eye, that circle moves. OK, so you'll figure that out and look it up on Google. But the point of that is if your dominant eye is your trail eye, OK, and maybe it is, and you have a big Serbian nose like me, OK, so what that means is when you make a backswing, it, a lot of people hate losing the connection, the direct view from their dominant eye to that golf ball. Okay, And I see this all the time. I figured this out, I don't know, 25 years ago on the lesson tee, 20 years ago on the lesson tee. Had this lefty from Canada would make this practice swing look like this. It was gorgeous. Okay, Make this practice swing. Looked really nice. He'd bend over to the golf ball, and then he did this funky move, and I scratched my head. I was giving him a few lessons. I'm like, wow, okay, I understand practice swings, real swings, okay. But usually it's because the face doesn't make sense, but his grip was nice. And then I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here? And then I started to notice this bizarre behavior with his head. And I thought, what's your dominant, what's your dominant eye? And sure enough, his trail eye was dominant. And so what we did was we got some painter's tape. Okay, I mean, this may not be you, but I'm telling a story and it's my show. I get to tell stories. So you get some painter's tape, just the stuff you can peel on. Doesn't hurt. You put it on some sunglasses so that your, if your trail eye is dominant, just cover it up with some blue or green painter's tape. And then teach yourself, you know, when, you're, when your non-dominant eye can see the golf ball, you won't be into this funky subconscious connection to the golf ball. Just something weird I've noticed in coaching for the past 20-something years. I see it at the golf school at least one student a week. So it's kind of, we always have a roll of painter's tape by and we always got some cheap sunglasses too. So what I'd consider for you is, what, you know, onto the more of that, maybe, maybe you don't have that issue. Maybe you're dominant eyes, your lead eye, and that's fantastic. So the event of the rhythm of getting set into a golf ball, okay, assuming you don't have a dominant eye issue and you're trying to not get blocked out by your nose, because right now if I close my left eye and make my backswing, guess what, big Serbian nose in the way, I can't see the ball. So you're going to figure out a way to see the ball, cock your head funny, maybe put your weight more on your lead side. But assuming that's not you and you don't have a Serbian nose, let's get you set up over a golf ball and feel pressure left and right in your feet. So I'm squeezing the mat a little bit. If I was Italian, I'd be making wine right now, squeezing the grapes, okay? So this little bit of pressure, I am a quarter Italian. So this little bit of pressure in the backswing, there's a little bit of a, I'm left for the last time, I'm on my lead foot for the last time, then I'm pressing into the right to get some energy to sling this golf club into a backswing. So through foot pressure, you have the ability to start rhythm differently. I see too many people go, and then they try to make a swing. No, okay. Let's get the club in our good hands. For the last time, it's on the ground. It's up off the ground. It's waggling. Big, big deal here. Club's off the ground. It's waggling. Okay. Waggling is this little wrist motion in conjunction with this rhythm in our feet. Go hike underscore M. And then, and then this foot pressure right here, 
I'm left for the last time, right? And that rhythm here, we don't want, and by the way, we don't want a backswing to be some sort of massive motion where the center of our upper mass goes to the right. It's very centered where we rotate, but since we have two 12 pound arms or 15 pound arms or whatever they weigh, and we're slinging them this way, pressure goes to the right. We physically shouldn't be trying to go left and right. I think there's another good question from Instagram coming about how much lateral motion, but this event of rhythm in this coming off the lead side, this push rotation slings our arms, that will load you onto your trail side just enough. And maybe you got the eye thing, maybe not, but check it out. Hopefully, go hike underscore M, that helps. Producer Steve, what do you have, my friend? Uh, right into what you just referenced to Craig from Instagram. How much lateral movement do you like to see during the golf Cool, so Craig from it, Craig 3474, something like that, from Instagram. Cool. So how much lateral motion do I like to see? So here's a, here's a good one. You know, the wee man, Jackson Chuck. Let me show you one here. Here's a, here's a goodie. Okay, good old plane station. So check this out. Show you what I did and what he did. Oh, I just unplugged her. Put that stick back in there. Got a little piece of pool noodle there. Groovy, this is going to go kind of up the old right leg. I'm going to hit a shot here. Get that situated. So we have a stick in here. It's the old 84 degree stick because I stole that off my good buddy Andrew Rice because he made a really cool video years ago about all good players and they wind up, they don't really lose this angle. So see when we stand here, our feet are a little wider than our hip bones. Okay, so that creates an angle inward. Well, during a backswing, Craig, you know, during this backswing, this event, you know, this angle pretty much stays there. I don't meander to my right and straighten this pool noodle up or just basically this little stick included with your plane station, okay? So I just put a pool noodle on it, just to make it a little bit more um, illustrative. So as I get organized over the golf ball and get set, I'll hit a shot here. Now watch what happens to that pool noodle. Absolutely nothing, okay? Now the wee man, Jackson Chuck, a little different. And he's 11, he's getting pretty good at golf. He plays the most forward tee and makes some pars and some bogeys. So I'm excited that he likes golf. He's swinging pretty good. But, you know, we noticed a little bit of this. A little bit of spinning out and bumping that thing out of the way. Now, you don't need this funky contraption to do that. It's just something we had handy. You could put a anything down there, a, a, a water bottle, anything off your right heel. Ultimately, Craig, a great exercise, okay? A great exercise, put a water bottle, put something that you can have to the right, or even a golf ball will be helpful. Because a golf ball, if you do it wrong, you'll roll this golf ball off the mat. You'll have this event where you kind of go, right? So there's no, there's reversing. There's just no lateral motion. I call it kind of stepping out the cigarette butt. Now you certainly can have too much leftward motion. I could rig that up to have it up my left side over here, okay? The, what we're looking for, and I honestly say, I, I feel it's different for a driver, and I know there's a question that came from Instagram too, we'll touch on about the driver impact condition and the irons impact condition. So these are nicely flowing, not that we set this up this way. I think it was absolutely by accident, but we'll take it. So I do see people do a lot of this. I see people go and get their weight pressure too far forward. And guess what that means? That means they're gonna hit it right of right if they don't do something to hit it straighter. So I see a lot of folks that want to get their weight pressure to the left. They do it a little too excitable. They get too much of them moving forward, which basically takes their swing hula hoop. You know, so here's the down and out portion of my swing right here. The more I move that forward, the more to the right, that's going to probably be on the golf ball. So we're not going to, we don't want that ball going way off to the right. So we have this subconscious fix of tossing the hands out of it to straighten things out. So to answer your question, do we want some lateral in the golf swing? We absolutely do because that little bit of lateral, little bit, this event of getting organized golf ball left of center, waggle, waggle. When I have this little bit of relocation, what does it do to my hands? You guys can see it moves my hands a little bit forward. That helps with my touching of the golf ball, brushing of the grass or the mat. 
if if I just rotate from back here, all I can do if I if I want to have ball first contact, I better hit a pull, or I better do some kind of powerless scoop. So we do need a little bit of stabilizing. There's my lateral, and then there's my rotational. So what I want to see you guys out there, we don't want to wander to the right, we don't want lateral to the right. We want to feel like our pivot can be pretty sharp, keeping that angle in our trail leg. We want to feel like we can stabilize into our lead side. That's all the lateral we need. You can kind of see the tourist trinker letters behind me there. I'm kind of getting into that K. And then there's the rotational piece. So also helpful thought. If you set up to the golf ball and the golf ball is on your left cheek or lead cheek for you lefties, okay, we don't want to get our head ahead of the golf ball. That's going to invite a little bit of a toss. We want to feel like we can keep that relationship without getting too much ahead of it okay so there is a stabilizing piece there is the the lateral there is the vertical and there's the rotational so once we rotate stabilize that's when we'll have our rotation and our pushes okay so hopefully that helps craig and you guys kind of stay within this these boundaries you know at the golf school i actually bought a walker i bought a walker off this kind lady down the street having a garage sale she wanted five dollars i got it for four serious negotiator not really i'm terrible at negotiating it's like yes 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 but my point is in the walker right it's got these boundaries right here you put your hands on we turn it around so it comes out this way if you are a big time i say a better player and hit hooks typically i'm going to see too much of this and not enough of rotation so we want to keep you in that boundary of the walker okay if you are a slicer Usually I'm going to want to see more of this bump the walker out of the way because typically you stay back and then you create too much leftward path to hit slices. So Craig, great question. Hopefully that helps. Producer Steve, what do we got? M. Reed writes, I have a tendency to break down my wrist or right elbow during my backswing, which makes it difficult to keep my wrist firm. Any suggestions? M. Reed writes, say that five times fast. M. Reed says, during his backswing, everything kind of turns to slop and say that one more time. Uh, it makes it difficult for him to keep his wrist firm. Sure. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say firm is necessarily a thing. Let's flash back to Bob in the Why You Suck segment, right? Bob had no problem being firm. Why do you think he had no problem being firm? Because he was really, really fast. You can't be super sloppy if you're really, really fast. You cannot, okay? So you had Bob who, you know, strong guy. And it was like whew, whew, super quick, right? Nothing about his swing was sloppy. Now, when you take a backswing, you go dee 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 dee, go get a cup of coffee and a donut, and come back, and then maybe we'll change direction. If you're super slow, chances are things can get overbent and sloppy. See, you were one of the 19 of the 20 people that I'd say, hey, let's up tempo the backswing a little bit. Let's get these protagonist antagonist muscles here to kind of help structure you out a little, okay? So the reflex arc over here, you know, this ball delivery system is a great way to get folks. Like, that's why I use it with like most of my beginners and a lot of really good players too. But most, most folks that are get too sloppy on the backswing, guess what you need? You need a little speed injection, babies. Yes, you do. We got to get this club off the ground. We got to speed this thing up because if we speed it up, instinctively, you kind of get in a bit more control. And I know speed scares a ton of you, but guess what? You want to hit it far? You need speed. Speed is commensurate. Backswing speed proportional to the downswing speed. And so, you know, it's not about going back super slow and then feeling like you're going to smash it. You're not going to. We need this event. And what I would ask you to do, M. Reed writes, or M. Reed, I'm just joking, but Steve had to choose the word writes after M. Reed. But as we put the club forward, start like this and hit a few. Get that club head ahead of the ball. Give me a trail heel off the ground, step and get this thing slinging so you've got some structural awareness and try to hit them kind of far. Do a before and after video. I bet you see that this trail arm and wrist condition naturally athleticizes, gets a little stronger, organizes, holds the weight of the club better and you won't be so flimsy in the wrist conditions. I think that's going to help you. Producer Steve, who do we have? From Instagram, the Andersberg. What's the difference between iron and driver impact position? Okay, cool. The Anders Berg question from Instagram. Difference between driver and irons. Let's set a couple of balls up here and let's talk about it. Impact positions. Well, a lot of it has to do with the setup position. So 
Let's go ahead and put two golf balls. You can kind of, from the face on, they kind of blot one another out from down the line. You can see that we have a couple there. So if I grab the driver and the six iron, let's just go through the setup and then the impact, okay? So setup with the driver, the ball is most forward within the stance, okay? So there's my setup for the driver, ball most forward within the stance. That's going to lend itself to a club traveling a little bit more level at the moment of the strike. Of course, if I'm really steep over the top, you can see the club's leaving the screen on the right screen, coming into the window. That's not going to be level. That's going to be hitting down. We don't want that. But with the ball the most forward in the stance, that gives us an opportunity to have somewhat of a level, mildly upward strike. So that's one of the things different at impact. We'll talk about the others in setup. So if I have the six iron, or say in this side, what do I have here? Seven iron. I have my awesome Hama TR20Vs. Check these out. They're amazing. This golf ball is a little bit more center left in my stance. So this is played farther back from my shoulder, my lead shoulder. Ball is center left in my stance. My hands are a little bit more ahead of the golf ball, even at address fractionally. Right? So there's a setup difference. So now if I have pressure on my lead side and unwind a bit, hopefully there's a little bit of forward shaft lean on that that you can see that's a little bit more pronounced than you're going to see in a second with the driver. So setup differences lend themselves to impact differences. Now the driver, is there forward shaft lean? Yeah, a little bit. I don't want the driver presenting to the ball like this or you're going to just hit it really high with no punch and way too much spin. Because even if this is traveling level, all that loft hits down low on the golf ball, close to the equator, spins the ball like crazy, hit a high one with no force on it. So the feels, the impact differences, when you're wider, your center, your body centers farther back. When you unwind, hopefully we get to a condition of impact where there's still this kind of nice looking line that goes up the shaft, up to the shoulder. Now a big critical piece for drivers, get your camera on, get your device, put it on slow-mo, put it caddy view, which is this face on view right here, not the DTL down the line, which is that camera. And what I want you to recognize with the driver versus the irons, you guys, good drivers, when they get to impact, what do you notice about my left shoulder relative to the ball? My lead shoulder is behind the golf ball. If my lead shoulder is ahead of the golf ball, guess what? Things got to break down or I got to hit it nine miles to the right. So our body, like look at our body like it's a, a, a few ovals. You have the oval of your hips. You have the oval of your shoulders. Well, I'd address with the driver, my shoulder is not behind the golf ball. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty even with the golf ball. There's the, my shoulder and the golf ball. But as I'm rotating this oval, the oval is now behind the ball. As I'm coming into impact, here's my stabilizing, my rotating. As I'm hitting the ball, my shoulder is now behind the ball. That oval has gone through its full motion now to where it's a little away, farther away from the ground than my right shoulder from a dress, you can kind of see that relationship right there. And that's how you can really have level upward strikes. You really can't hit level and upward if your lead shoulder gets ahead of the golf ball. So you got to recognize that in this rotation of this dimension, shoulders, the lead shoulder turns down in the backswing. There's a little pressure. And in this unwinding, that shoulder gets up, back, and behind you. And it will actually be behind the golf ball when you smash it. Same with the pelvis. We don't want to meander too far to the left. We want to feel like our hip can get back and behind us. And I'll tell you, here's an interesting thing. In my studio, I have a great video of Mike Trout, okay, baseball smasher. Center fielder for uh, angels. angels. Thank you. Baseball junkie producer Steve here, okay? So this guy stands probably six foot tall, 240. He's a stocky dude that comes plays golf the Raven regularly. Super nice guy. And watching him do these, hit, watching him hit, I show my students this on video. So here's this big guy. He likes the pitch. This lead leg goes boom, okay? So all this weight just went pow into the ground. Then it's a big rotational event. He hits the ball. So for the millisecond of the strike, weight vector off the lead foot is very much angular back toward his center. No, I'm getting a little techy here, but hang in there with me for a second. So he likes the pitch, boom, weight goes, hits really hard on the lead side. He unwinds, smack. Then for a second, his weight is all back here. So and it's not necessarily, with a driver, you've got this relationship, wider stance, stabilizing weight pressure, rotation. Weight actually goes kind of pop, pop, 
And then to a finish, with the most effective drivers, it doesn't just kind of meander to the left and have this lovely finish like a lot of very good iron strikers. So going back to the iron a little bit. Man, you asked a juicy question here. Cool. So the iron, you know, the, obviously the golf ball is a little bit more center left in our stance between my two very cool Nike Love and Peace shoes here, babies, right? So in this situation, you know, as I hit this, momentum slings the club up, weight pressure is forward. When I hit this, my shaft's, this shaft's going to be leaning, you know, a fair amount onto the golf ball before overtaking. It's not going to be quite the, you know, the event of stabilizing, rotating with the weight kind of popping back a bit before you go forward. So do me a favor, get on YouTube, look up Mike Trout, watch a few baseball hitters because you'll see some cool things and how weight goes, bam, stabilizes, gets forward, how rotation happens. This is a long driver pattern too, by the way. They're not getting ahead of what they're hitting. They're staying behind what they're hitting. An iron, we're more on top of what we're hitting. And those are the primary differences. With an iron, obviously, we're trying to touch the ball, brush the grass, bake and strip divot. With a driver, we're not trying to touch anything but tip the tee over and have the ball be melted off the middle of the face. So hopefully those are some pieces about the differences of the driver and the irons. And if I miss something, I apologize. Tune in next week. Producer Steve, what do we have? Jean-Louis from France. Jean-Louis? Huh? Is the medicine ball drill a good one? The medicine ball drill? Depends what medicine ball drill you're doing, Jean-Louis. I should say, gosh, I, can't, I took some French in school and I'm embarrassed. I'm like having a blank here in front of the camera. But I love medicine ball drills. Let me explain why. A lot of students, and this is obviously, this is great for just what we talked about. Instead of a medicine ball, I am going to grab the old or striker plane pillow because the smash bag portion of this has some heft in it okay so this event I do this with students all the time we have them toss something kind of heavy and I'd say guessing 12 15 pounds of full of old blankies and stuff here a couple magazines at the bottom to give it a little bit of structure so this rhythm of giving this a proper heave watch what I'm doing here and smash you see the rhythm of that's catching myself. That's my body getting athletic, pushing. There's some rotation and pushing happening there. That's a big, powerful move in golf. Fantastic question because I want to show you how it creates the trebuchet, which you guys invented, right? So not just a catapult, but a trebuchet. So now I'm clicking here. Hang with me, Jean-Louis. All right, so I've got this heavy thing. I, ha I need some energy to rhythmically get this up. Guess what's doing that? Push into the ground. I need to stabilize myself, catching myself and my muscles in my body, and then pushing and rotating, okay? So that feels really good. Sometimes with newbies, they'll just have them do it this way, just extension, just learn how to extend. Because a lot of folks were taught to keep their head down so much that, that they don't even have this extension piece. They don't know how to heave. Really, it kind of feels fun to do that. But here's my point about adding that in and how it creates the analogy to the trebuchet. And you guys absolutely won the historical battle of how to throw a cow over a castle wall the farthest because a catapult is just a one lever deal. Doink! Not too good. The trebuchet, you guys figured out how to put a rope back here, put the weight here, now this event made the rope go whoo, and then the cow went over the castle wall and who knows what it did once it landed. My clubs are making me nervous here. I'm going to move these back a foot or two. There we go. Groovy. So here's my point on this and why a medicine ball works great. And honestly, I like the soft medicine balls because you can smash them. When you throw them, they don't roll, run away from you. But here's what I want you to think about. These two centers, okay? You think about the lead shoulder and the left hand. So if you want to have power, we've got to have power. If I was going to throw something, lobby a medicine ball forward, I'm going to bend down to the ground, use all my posterior chain to stand up, and then use my arms to throw it. That's just the flexion and extension, okay? We need that in golf, but we also need rotational pieces too. So think about this. Lead shoulder, lead hand. This shoulder is going to work its way 
a little bit down toward the ground. If you watch that right screen there, you can see my shoulders don't, don't turn level. That's a big no-no we see with tons of people. Okay, I want this lead shoulder to have a little bit of a downward dimension in it because now that's traveling down. It went from where it started downward. This is traveling upward. Oh, and by the way, I'm taking on a little bit of the, and go to YouTube, watch a trebuchet, coolest thing ever, okay? This left shoulder is going down. I'm creating some hinge. Guess what it's going to do now? It's going to go down some more. And guess what it can do when it goes down some more? It can go up. So I'm using muscles and rotation to make it go up. And oh, and by the way, here's the lever with the rope. There's the cow over the castle wall. So when you do these med ball extensions, okay, and then you add it to the feelings of how a shoulder, and this is why Rory absolutely pounds it. It's the most economical event I've seen. So the lead shoulder is working down. This whole thing is, and then we sling it, and that's how we can have some pretty good speed for our physicality. So merci, great question from France. Who's next? Golfman 5900. I lose my spine after impact. I finish with a more vertical spine. Is there any significance? Golf man 5900. I lose my my foot my bends basically. I find myself kind of popping up, right? Welcome to the club. So we had this great guy in for a lesson last week in the scorching hot Phoenix summer, but I, you kind of get used to it. And I always say, you know, I'd rather be shoveling sunshine than snow. Okay, so I use analogies when I coach because I find them, I have stories and analogies to be a little bit more sticky, a little bit more memorable. So I, you know, I so say you get out of the shower and you got some water in your, in your right ear, turn your head to the right like this and get the water to come out. Okay, it's coming out. Maybe give yourself a little tap in the head, okay? So the feelings I want you to have, and this was an exercise we did with a fella, is that we're going to hit some shots and we're going to wait for the water to come out of the ear. And if you do this on the range when you're practicing in a public range, trust me, nobody will practice beside you. You'll have tons of space, okay? So you're going to hit this little shot and you're going to just kind of <laughs> do this a couple times. You will be left alone, okay? Nobody will bother you. So get set up. And this is more about kind of the balance, center, balance centers in your eyes and how you're going to start to see things a little differently. Now, the reason you probably jump up and have this flat post-impact relationship might be because you're trying to do something to the face. Maybe the face is open and you're trying to square it, and that's why you kind of push and get the right shoulder a little high. So earlier in this video, I talked about the gentleman who came over the top, and I talked about where the face is and how to do the grip in this position of what we call P6 delivery right here, nice and flat. People do this, this drill, and they'll, and they'll still kind of do this. And they'll still kind of do this, but just nice and flat, okay? Because momentum should have that pretty flat, if not a little bowed right there, but not excessively. And then let's make sure your lead hand's on there nicely, okay? Just tour neutral lead hand. And then from there, as you hit some shots, watch me let the water drip out of my right ear as I hit this shot. Shake that water out. Now notice my eye line. Eye line's very tilted. I'm still in my right side bend. My buns are still back. So what I want you to do as a drill, just get an eight iron, give me an 80 yard shot, give me a 100 yard shot, give me a 120, 140, and then max it out, okay? So start at 80 and just do 20 yard increments, but see if we, as we hit the shot, we can kind of keep our eye line tilted, which is weird for most, water dripping out, keep that there. And you know, when the ball is long gone and when you want to relax, take a little pressure off right side bending, because for a lot, those obliques, that back, maybe it's not in a healthy situation. Knock wood, I've been pretty healthy back and, and obliques haven't bothered me. So that, that motion, that drill doesn't bother me. A lot of people that side bending creates a little bit of too much pinch in the lower back. So anyway, I think that will help you. And again, it, there's always a root to it. And the root was probably the face and how you had to respond to that face to try to hit square shots. So look at the grip first. Maybe second, make sure the wrist conditions don't do something funky, over rolling. I see a lot. I see so much of that golf school that, you know, so much over rolling, the face gets open. Then you need to kind of unwind all that, and that's why you might get up to. So let's make sure the face doesn't get over rolled in the backswing. Nothing crazy. Not a lot of lead forearm roll. Very kind of peaceful forearms. 
you know, give me some water out of the right ear and you'll stay in your side bend better. So great question. Producer Steve, what do we have? Yeah, last one for today. Douglas Belton watched the webinar with Peter Croker and really liked the push the hand, uh, right hand bend drill and yes. the V drill, if you'd be able to. Demonstrate. Sure, Douglas Belton. The push the right hand, right, right arm bent and then the A to B drill. So Peter Croker, mentor, coach of mine, love the guy, Ozzy, great guy. We're going to do these webinars once in a while. He, he's a, I've learned a lot from him over the years and he's, he's a big part of how I use my goofy expressions. There's a mild thread of Peter Croker in there in a, in a lot of what I do. So the push the right arm bent drill and the A to B drill. Okay, so I'm going to paraphrase. Sorry, Peter, if I butcher this a little bit. But he has a golfing machine background. So here's my book, The Golfing Machine. And there's cute little pink stickies on there that my daughter adorned on there from years ago. But that's always, that was on the nightstand for 20 years. Now it just sits here in my office, okay? So the Homer Kelly made a comment about right arm extensor action. So rather than the right arm retracting, which so many do, because that's an easier thing to do, is to pull, pushing is harder. This is an extensor action. I'll get into this a little bit. It'll be our last question and we'll finish up and lots of thanks to the sponsors and stuff. But imagine if I made this plane mate band, my left arm. So here is my new left arm and here is my right arm. And I've got my, here I am at address, left arm and right arm. Now there's just a little bit of tension there. Perfect. There's my left arm. If I go back and I overbend my right arm, what just happened to my left arm? Super soft. If I have a structured extensor action of my right arm, my left arm stays long. So when people say, hey, Martin, I always bend my left arm, I say, well, it's your right arm's fault. So here's the push the right arm bent exercise. You know, this sensation of basically keeping our arms in front of us, there's pushing my right arm bent. So at address, it's fairly long. I'm pushing it bent. There's a bit of a bend and a bit of a bend in the right wrist. Some great coaches nowadays, this is how a lot of their students hit a lot of shots. Okay, Peter was doing this many, many, many years ago. So there's my arm in front of me. It's pushed bent. I can turn and then I can go A to B. Okay, A to B simply means that golf is a two target game. The ball's got a target and our club head has a target. Two targets, ball, target, club, ball. Simple enough. So going A to B, Douglas, is a lot of people, so here's my, be pretty easy now for that club to work not to the ball in its initial motion. This is working toward the target line. A lot of people love to do this. Okay, this is an A to B, A to B. And that's in a, that hit motion, okay, Peter says enjoy the hit. That's a motion that basically if the club head wasn't epoxied on here, it might fly off and go in the corner of my room over there. It's got an inside out event to it, just because just like a hula, like just like an inclined hula hoop would. The A to B goes to the ball, the continuation would be that way. Now, since we're a center and this is epoxied on here, it doesn't do that. It continues up on its journey back up and in, because that's just the law of a circle. But the sensation A to B, golf is a two-target game. The ball's target, the ball, I'm sorry, the, the target for the ball is the flag or the fairway. And then the target for the club head is the ball. So here's my A to B. And so that's just a nice, simple way of clarifying the push the right arm bent, okay, not retracting. And then A to B isn't something where we uncock over or do anything this way that would result in us kind of having to steer the bus late to get the club on it. Just a simple way for us to feel like we're uncocking the golf club, not pulling the handle, destroying our radius, uncocking the golf club A to B right on the back of the ball. So hopefully that added a bit of clarity. And you should look up Peter's work. He does a great job and explains that way more thoroughly than that little time allowed. So any more questions? We'll wrap up in the questions. So you guys, I think that um, I love this little Q&A session because basically that's what I do all day. It's, it's super fun. We do it face to face with students at our golf school. Golf schools, they're the ones, that, uh, the traveling schools are sold out. No more room in those. So thank you for those I'm going to see. Fantastic. The, I know everybody's still freaked out about the virus. I totally understand. But we are starting end of October in Phoenix at the Raven Phoenix. 
you know what? Flying couldn't be easier right now. And inexpensive too. The hotel is great. And if you come see me at the Raven Phoenix, we start at the end of October. We go pretty much every week until May, early in May when it gets a little too warm. You will have a blast. You will get much better. And you will love the continuity program that follows the golf school. Once you leave us, you don't really leave us. You can't get rid of me because I'm going to make sure I'm going to follow up with you to make sure that you understand things. We have a relationship back and forth, coach student, so that you have clarity on your goals and what your tasks are. So hopefully you enjoyed this session. Big thanks to my sponsors, Hanma Golf. <coughs> Love these. Even Roll Putters. Nike, thank you very much. Foresight. Sponsors, thanks so much. Brought to you by those guys. If it wasn't for those guys, I'd still be in bed right now, dreaming of stuff, maybe getting up and going playing golf. But no, I'm here with you, and I enjoy it. So thanks for watching. We will see you next week.